This Sunday, we're continuing our sermon series on Acts by talking about the price of boldness, the price of courage. And just to recap, if you've missed some of the ones in the last few weeks, we're in the sermon series on the book of Acts, which is Luke part two. So if you're familiar with the gospel according to Luke, the same writer wrote Acts and it picks up right where Luke ends. And so you have Luke as, as kind of Luke one, you have Acts as Luke two. And it's what happened to the believers after Jesus was ascended into heaven. And it begins with that, that Jesus, the resurrected Christ is with the disciples and he's kind of giving them some instructions. And he's telling them, wait for the Holy Spirit. Don't do anything until the Holy Spirit comes. And so they mess up and get it right for the first time ever. They, they actually do what he says, they understand, they wait. And the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost and they're filled with the Holy Spirit in an amazing way and they're given the ability to speak in the languages of all the people in the surrounding areas. You know, for us, it might be like being able to speak Spanish and French and Italian, real languages so that they can share their faith and gospel with other people. And then they set about kind of getting organized for ministry because now they're empowered to share the gospel, even though they're in still a hostile place where they're persecuted but they have a spirit of boldness and they have the ability, they have the, the passion, but they also have the know-how to share their faith. And so they begin to select a, a disciple to take the place of Judas because they wanna get back to the original 12, number of 12, and they select a man named Matthias and they say that we need somebody to take the place of Judas as a witness to the resurrection. And that's how they define being a disciple, is someone who's a witness to the resurrection. And then they begin to share the gospel and Peter is one of the first ones who is sharing the gospel in the temple. He gets arrested. He gets taken before the council, the same council Jesus was taken in front of, the Sanhedrin, the, the temple authorities, not your rank and file Jewish believers, but the ones who had the power, the authority figures. And Jesus is brought on trial before them. And now we have Peter on trial before them. And it's because he was seen healing somebody in the name of Christ a person that everybody knew. And they didn't really know what to do with Peter because everyone in the area had seen the healing and knew about it. And so that if they arrested him and executed him or something, there'd be an uprising. So they were kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. So they ended up letting him go. And so now the believers are out there sharing the gospel and are becoming more and more persecuted. Now, as I was thinking about that and reading for this week, I began thinking about a television show that I've been watching on Netflix. Does anybody here watch TV series on Netflix? A few hundred of you, okay. Now, Netflix is good, but it's also dangerous, right? Because if you start watching something and you've got access to all 100 episodes, you might find yourself at 3 a.m. watching the fifth season, third episode of whatever, you know, instead of doing what you were made to do, which is sleep at 3 a.m. And you didn't clean the dishes and you didn't do the laundry and you haven't packed the lunches, but you've seen every episode of season four of Arrested Development, right? And so you're ready to, to blog about it or put something on Facebook, but you're, you're wearing dirty clothes and your hair's oily at work. That's the problem, not personal, I've just heard. That's the problem with Netflix. Well, there's a show on there I've been watching lately that probably no, none of you probably heard of, it's pretty obscure, called Foil's War. Has anybody ever watched an episode of that? Am I the only nerd? Oh, sorry, Brian. Oh, I told you to. Okay, so you're off, you're off the hook. It's set in England during World War II. A detective named Christopher Foyle is his name. And he's about 55 years old. He served in World War I and came home and became a detective. And he is the detective chief superintendent in kind of a rural area of England on the south coast. And he wants to be serving in World War II because Britain's being bombed. I mean, London is being raided every night by the Luftwaffe and all, the whole country's in a terror. And he wants to be serving, but because of his age, he, you know, he wasn't able to re-enlist. And for whatever reason, he hasn't been able to get in the war effort. So he feels kind of stuck there doing the mundane tasks of a detective. And so the name of the title is kind of a play on that. He's kind of fighting his own war, uh, stuck at home, doing not what he wants to do. But 
in a sense, being a part of the war effort because he's dealing with people profiteering on the war, people on the black market. You know, there's rationing going on, and people don't have food to eat. And then others are trying to take advantage of that, even while the convoys are being torpedoed, which makes supply scarce. The men are dying, and you have people trying to profit on that. You also have Nazi sympathizers in England at the time who, who didn't want to go to war and who felt like Hitler had it right, believe it or not. So he's dealing with all these things, and his assistant's got him, Sergeant Milner, who had fought in Europe, World War II, and lost his leg, and came home. And in those times, attitudes towards disability were a little different. And this man had fought as a hero in World War II, had lost his leg, came home, and his wife wouldn't accept him in the state that he was in. And because he had lost a leg, she saw him as less of a man or less of a person and, and left him. And as you watch the different episodes, you see the men coming home from the war and you see the loss. You see not only the physical amputations, but the emotional amputation and the, the shattered lives and the, and the shattered relationships. And you can't help but see the price of boldness of these men who've gone overseas and fought, the high, high price that they and even today, our servicemen and women pray for the boldness of confronting evil in the world and protecting freedom. And in many ways, Acts is about that. Acts is about the price of boldness. You have a group of believers there who, who have something in their heart that they believe fervently and they, they feel the calling of God, but they're in a place where it's life or death to say the word Jesus. You know, we don't have any frame of reference for that. That by saying the name Jesus, I could be arrested and killed or executed. We, you know, we think, well, someone might think I, I might sound stupid. That, that's our fear of persecution for sharing our faith. But when we read in Acts, it's a whole different thing. There's a war going on there too, a spiritual war. And the early disciples are in many ways behind enemy lines, you might say, but armed with the gospel. We're going to begin this morning in Acts chapter 4, verse 32, and just a quick insight into how the believers are living, because it's a great picture of what it is to be a church family. And it may make you a little uncomfortable. I hope it does, because what you see here is a, a tremendous picture of sacrificial living, of putting other people ahead of yourself, that the early church really understood what it meant to be a church family. If you have your Bibles, we're in Luke, excuse me, well, we are in Luke, Luke part two, Acts chapter four, verse 32. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions. With everything, but everything they owned was held in common. Listen to that. No one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. Now, I can't help but think about that while our youth are driving up to Kentucky to serve the poorest people I've ever seen in our country. I've been up to Appalachia, there's nothing in Alabama to compare to the poverty up there. And in fact, I put a photo essay on our church Facebook page and on my Facebook page from the very community that we're going to be serving in, and it will, it will really blow your mind. It, it, it's not just an economic poverty, it's a, it's a cultural poverty that you just have to see it to understand. And so I, I challenge you to... to to look for that online when you get home and you'll see where we're going to be serving. I'm going up later today. The early church was very interested in the needy. The early church was, was committed to the poor, was committed to, to living out their faith in service to others. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet. Remember that phrase. We're going to come back to that. That's, there's a lot of symbolism in that. They laid it at the apostles' feet, 
and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas. He sold a field that belonged to him, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, not everybody was fully on board with this program, as you might imagine, even among the believers. Not everyone was fully faithful to this. And we hear the story of Ananias and Sapphira. A man named Ananias, with the consent of his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property with his wife's knowledge. He, with his wife's knowledge, he kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part and laid it, here we are again, laid it at the apostles' feet. Ananias, Peter asked, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the proceeds of the land? You see, Ananias was presenting this as if it was the whole thing. He, in essence, said, I sold the back 40 over here, and I'm bringing all the proceeds like everybody else, and I'm going to lay them at the apostles' feet as a sign of this is to support the ministry of the apostles. This is to support the ministry of the word. But Peter sees what's going on. Peter, maybe in his countenance, sees the duplicity and says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit to keep back part of the proceeds of the land? I mean, while it remained unsold, was it not your own? You didn't, you didn't have to sell it. And after it was sold, were not the proceeds at your full disposal? So how is it that you've contrived this deed in your heart? You did not lie to us, but to God. Now, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down right there and died. And a great fear seized all who heard of it. The young men came and wrapped up his body, and they carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife showed up, not knowing what had just happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you and your husband sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yeah, that was the price. That was, that's what it was. And Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together, you and Ananias, to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Look, the feet of those who've buried your husband are even now at the door. And they'll carry you out too. And immediately she fell down at his feet and died. When the young men came in, they found her dead. So they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized the whole church and all who had heard of these things. So in the early church, there's this sense of mission that we're in this together. It's not every man, woman, and child for themselves. It's not I got mine, you go get yours, and whatever happens to you happens, and whatever happens to me happens, and hey, that's on you, you're you. No, there's this sense that we're one in Christ, we're one body. That'd be like my left hand saying to my right hand who's cut and bleeding, hey hand, you're on your own. And, and maybe I'm bleeding so bad out of this hand that I'm gonna die, really. But this hand says, hey, that's not my problem, that's, that's your problem not realizing that the whole thing's going to go down, that there's no left hand and right hand. There's just Wade. There's just one Wade. And the early church saw itself as one body that couldn't say, hey, I don't need you because it did. And there was this overarching concern to provide for each other. Now, in our church, we do that with our Good Samaritan Fund and with the communion offerings we take up. And when a family in the church is in need, loses a job, financial, medical, whatever, you know, we care for each other. And that's what that's about. That's where that comes from biblically. But Ananias and Sapphira, they wanted to look like they were living according to that. It wasn't that they, they didn't, weren't faithful. It was more than that, that they brought it as if it was the full thing. They wanted to look faithful without being faithful. They wanted to appear one way and be another as if God doesn't know what we do with what we have. And Peter says, hey, you're not lying to me. You're lying to God. And the consequences are great. When I read that story, I realize that boldness has a price, but so does a lack of boldness. So does cowardice. 
So does duplicity, so does dishonesty. What I really learned is that everything has a price. Not doing the right thing has a price, even worse than doing the right thing when it's hard. And so they laid at the feet of the apostles, in essence, a lie, a lie. And so we pick up then in chapter six with this whole program that the early church has of caring for the widows, caring for the orphans, caring for the needy. Chapter six, now during those days when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists, which means the Christians that were from a Greek descent, not Jewish, but from a Greek or Roman descent probably, they complained against the Hebrews, the Christians who were Jewish, because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. This is the first early church squabble, yeah, yeah, within the church, all right? This is the first, you know, kind of argument, dispute, and the Jewish Christians are arguing with the Greek Christians saying, hey, you know, the food that the widows get is more for the Jewish ones than for the Hellenists. It's not fair. Nothing, this isn't being done right. So the 12 apostles called together the whole community of the disciples and said, it's not right that we should neglect the word of God to wait on tables. Now, this is a biblical joke, okay? This is what passes for stand-up in the Bible, okay? So just laugh a little bit, you know, just so that you could say, yeah, the joke has, the Bible has jokes in it. They're basically saying this big fight over this, this isn't, we're not supposed to be waiting tables. We're supposed to be preaching the word. So we can't spend our time figuring out who got how much rice and who got three pounds of beans and somebody got two and a half pounds of beans. It's not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who we can appoint to this task. They delegate it to some others who they make deacons. While we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer. What they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, whose real name in the Greek is Stephanos, which means crown, which will be important later, like the crown that a king wears. Stephanos, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on him. And then the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So you can see they're very serious, and they're very organized about their ministry to the poor. It's not tangential to what they're doing. It's not just another program. It's, it's a part of their identity as believers then and now to be wholly invested and in solidarity with the poor. As judges, no as servants, not as judges, but as servants. And they organize themselves to accomplish that task. So Stephen is one of those people. And so now we learn what happens to him. Stephen, full of grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen as it was called, stood up and argued with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. Then they secretly instigated some men to say, we've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people as well as the elders and the scribes. Then they suddenly confronted him, seized him, and brought him before the council. This is the same council they brought Peter before last week. This is the same council they brought Jesus before some probably 80, 90 days before. The Sanhedrin, the, the temple authorities, the same people who tried Jesus now have Stephen before them. They set up false witnesses who said, this man never stops saying things against this holy place and the law, for we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses handed to us. And all who sat in the council looked intently at him, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. And so then Stephen goes back through scripture for him and says, in essence, starting with 
Abraham and going all the way back through Moses and Jacob and Isaac and the prophets, he goes through the whole story of the Israelite people. And he says, at every stop along the way, you got it wrong. At every opportunity, you turned your back on God. Every prophet that God gave you, you persecuted and rejected. At every point, you have failed to listen to the word of God. You have failed to see where God's trying to lead you. And here you are again doing the same thing. Verse 51, he says, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, John the Baptist, and now you've become his betrayers and murderers. You are the ones that receive the law as ordained by angels, and yet you have not kept it. You know, Stephen here is the defender of the faith. Now he's a saint, Saint Stephen in the, in the Catholic tradition. He is a saint because of what happened to him next. And the name Stephanos, meaning crown, has a deeper meaning because he wore the crown of martyrdom. He wore the crown of one who gave everything. Think back about Ananias and Sapphira. What did they lay at the, foot of the, the feet of the apostles? What they, what they lay there? And we're just talking about possessions, okay? What did they lay at the feet of the apostles? They laid a lie. They laid a false witness. They laid duplicity at the feet of the apostles. Stephen, he's about to lay something much more valuable at the feet of Christ. I'm reminded years ago of the first kind of big school shooting type thing that happened in, in my kind of adult consciousness at Columbine. I know many of you remember that. Columbine High School in Colorado. A young man named Dylan Klebold who was kind of an outsider and disaffected and unhappy with his life, his world, one day put on black trench coat and had all kinds of weapons in it, went into the school. Of course, the school had never seen anything like this, countenanced anything like this, totally unprepared, and began to do something horrific. In some ways, I see that connected to what happened at Sandy Hook and as the beginning of, of a kind of sickness in these recurring events. And part of what was on his heart was also on the heart of the people holding Jesus on trial. Part of what happened there began right here. Because what, a part of what he did at that school was to ask people if they believed in Jesus. And, and maybe you've forgotten that fact, but part of his objective was to put Christians on the spot and to see if they would renounce God. And what I recall most was a young lady, a young high school student, with her whole life ahead of her. Not unlike a lot of the young people in our church. A beautiful young girl who just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And this young man, filled with darkness, catching her in that cafeteria and pointing a gun at her and asking her if she believed in Jesus. At gunpoint. Let's talk about the price of boldness. Let's talk about our forebearers in the faith. Let's talk about truth from the mouths of babes. Let's talk about spiritual maturity not having anything to do with age. Let's talk about true faith. 
in God. As you may recall, that young lady, she did not renounce her faith. She claimed it. She claimed Christ in the face of imminent death. And where, do, where does that spring from? Where does that spring from? What, what makes someone love Jesus that much? For 2,000 years, a love story, a beautiful love story of God and his people. And that began with Stephen, who was following in the footsteps of Christ. Verse 54, when they heard these things, they became enraged at Stephen. How dare you confront us? How dare you challenge us? How dare you accuse us? Who do you think you are? When they heard these things, they became enraged and they ground their teeth at Stephen. And I want you to imagine this scene, some 70 people gathered in this room and, and there is Stephen all alone. No attorney, no advocate, all alone before the council. And when he finishes talking, I just imagine an eruption of noise. I just imagine people screaming and yelling and pointing at him and talking among themselves, just, just total chaos. And yet in the midst of that, Stephen is kind of at the eye of the storm. It's as if he is there, but not there. Physically there, but not spiritually there. Unaffected, like he's in the eye of the hurricane. Because filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed up into heaven. and saw the glory of God. What we were singing, glorious, glorious, you are glorious. You are glorious. He gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and, and he said to whoever might be listening, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears. Now in the scripture, you see a lot of different kind of forms of this. You see they hardened their hearts. You see they had scales over their eyes. You see they covered their ears. All metaphorical, if nothing else, if nothing more, to say they were closed to this. They had in mind their own way of seeing the world and what they were going to do, and they weren't open to anything he said. Now, how often is that true for us that we have our worldview or we have our opinion or we have what we were told growing up or whatever or our prejudice, and we cling to it with white knuckles so, so much that we could never hear God? And so he calls them stiff-necked because they won't turn. They are fixed. And so they are dead to the Spirit. They're not, they're not open to the movement of the Holy Spirit. They covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Let's remember for a moment, Stephen's not some random person who doesn't have a family. Isn't it easy to kind of reduce him to just kind of a one-dimensional character? Just ink on the page? He's not. He had hopes and dreams. He had a family. They dragged him out of the city and they began to stone him, which means they took rocks, maybe the size of a grapefruit. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And in that day, the people who had been witnesses against him were required to be the first ones. That was part of the custom. 
just as a way of proving that what you were saying was really true, if you were one of the people who testified against him, you had to pick up the first rocks. And those who had testified against him were put up to it, in this case, and they knew that what they were saying was false, and yet they still picked up those stones. Isn't it amazing the evil that we are capable of? They picked up the stones and began to stone him, and the witnesses laid their cloaks at the feet of a young man named Saul, who you'll learn more about starting next week, who becomes Paul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. You recognize that? Where's that from? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus' words from the cross. How is it possible that he's kneeling down there, they're stoning him, and he's praying for them? How's that possible that he's not in a rage or consumed with terror or like me in this kind of self-righteous mode that's thinking, you may have me now, but when you die and stand before God, you're going to get yours. That God's going to write the scales, kind of a, maybe a holy wrath that says, you're going to burn. You're going, you know, God's judgment will be against you for doing this to me. That, that's probably where I would have been in kind of this vengeance, justice kind of place. He wasn't in the justice, vengeance place, was he? He was in the compassion, grace, mercy place. He wasn't calling down God's wrath. He wasn't in the Old Testament. He wasn't in, in Elijah mode. He was in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, in the Jesus mode that can only happen when our hearts are broken and remade like Christ. He is looking on the people killing him with sympathy. Can you believe that? That God can do that? Amazing. He says, Lord, do not hold this against them. When he had said this, he died. And Saul approved of their killing him. You know, those witnesses laid their cloaks down at the feet of, of Saul because he was probably the prosecutor of the case. His job among the Sanhedrin was to um, investigate and bring to trial people accused of Christianity and to put them on trial. So the witnesses were kind of working. He was like the district attorney for the Sanhedrin. And so the witnesses were serving him with their lies. And so they laid their cloaks at his feet. Now think about this going back. The, the early disciples, the people in the early church laid their possessions, their money, their property at their feet to serve the needy. Because that's how Ananias and Sapphira got off track. But the early believers laid their possessions at the feet of the apostles so that the apostles could go and do ministry with those resources. Then you have Stephen, not his possessions, laying his life. Everything he is and everything he could ever hope to be. at the feet of Christ. And then you have these witnesses laying their cloaks. You would take those off before you stone someone so that you could really wind up. That's really what that was about. So you could wind up really good. Lay their feet at the feet of Saul. When I read that, what I realize is that we all lay our lives down at the feet of something. The early Christians, Stephen, these false witnesses, you, me, we all lay our lives down before some altar. 
Maybe it's wealth, power, the corporate ladder. Maybe it's family, maybe it's a hobby, but we all trade our life in for something. We trade our, our time and our days and our resources for something, probably without thinking about what we're really getting for that price, because it's a high price. Because you only have one life. But the people in the story, they're all laying their lives down at someone's feet. And, and I believe we're laying our lives down at the foot of something. Each of us, everybody worships something. The question is, what is it? And is it holy and good? Is it eternal or fleeting? Is it pure or polluted? Does it leave a legacy of good? a path for your children, or a lie. You see, boldness has a price, but so does a lack of boldness. And everybody worships something. In the era of World War II and Foyle's War, Winston Churchill said these words that have always meant so much to me. When I graduated high school, my best friend's mom had this kind of calligraphy for me on, and, and framed, which I long since broke in college and then lost. But the quote has stuck with me and has meant so much to me, something Winston Churchill said in the World War II era, era. And I think it's about these opportunities for boldness that we all have. To each, there comes in their lifetime a special moment when they are figuratively tapped on the shoulder and offered the chance to do a very special thing, unique to them and fitted to their talents. What a tragedy if that moment finds them unprepared or unqualified for that which could have been their finest hour. The early disciples were prepared. Stephen qualified for what was and is his finest hour. Are we? Are we prepared to be bold, filled with the Spirit, and clear eyed on our objective? to the glory of Christ. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this time of worship and the blessing it is to be in your house. The blessing it is to come and celebrate your grace and your goodness and to think about the boldness of the first disciples, the, the boldness of the first apostles, Lord, and, and to see that as a foil for our own lives. They started this race and, and they've handed the baton to us. Have we dropped it, Lord? In this, our leg of the race to run, the, the race of faith, are we being faithful to our forebears? Are we running it faithfully, boldly? Are we running at all? Lord, may we Search our hearts as we study Acts together. As we follow and are inspired by the faithfulness of the first disciples. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.